Uh, we got Mark Sell here. He's the first one that uh, chimed in. Cool. Glad to have you. Mark Parker, Colorado, which is maybe about 50 miles up the road to the north of us. So nice to be back in the building. If you have a Roxim question, go ahead and put it in the chat. That's what we're here for is to help you out with Roxim, uh, answering your questions, how to do things, how to make design better rockets, how to simulate them better. Um, this is all about you. I don't have any questions that came in, so go ahead. Somebody is saying choppy audio. Oh, let me check the microphone. Checking that, checking that, sound problems. Good now, says Marcel. <laughs> Okay, good. I'm glad to see that. We have Jacob Ryder here, and he says, I'm going to fly an ultimate Dark Star on an N3400 next summer. Haven't simmed it yet, but looking forward to. Okay, cool. And, um, I think that's a lock kit. Um, cool. And Terry says, build a low-wing glider. <laughs> okay, low-wing glider. I don't know what a low-wing glider is compared to a high-wing glider, but we can give it a try. <laughs> i got my water here. Let me take a sip. Oh, I didn't turn the air conditioning on in this room early enough, so it's kind of kind of warm. So, <laughs> um, If you are new... Oh, it's a wild man. Wild man ultimate. Uh, we have Fat Bank from... Uh, Texas? Cool. I was just in Texas last week. It was hot in Texas. I don't know how you guys do it. You guys are a different breed of people than me. <laughs> I don't usually mind warm weather, but that was hot. Um, yeah, what am I looking for? What am I looking for? Um, I wanted to show you my desktop. And before I do that, let me open it up in a browser window. There we go. Okay, now I can show you my desktop. Okay, so here is the Apogee website, apogeerockets.com. If you are new, there's a scrolling banner bar here, and there's a Roxim 10, and that's what we're using. Um, if you click on that banner, it will take you to where you can download Roxim, get a free trial version, all that good stuff. Um, if you're br also brand new, if you go back to the home page, and if you scroll down on our home page down to the Roxim training right here, and if you click on this image, it'll take you to our archive page. And this lists all the things that we talked about. Um, we are on episode 34 today, and it's August 18th. Michelle was here last week. Thank you, Michelle, for handling it. Um, oh, she talked about my visit to the Ursa, Mer Ursa Major facility. Ursa Major is a, a rocket company. They make rocket motors for big rockets. Uh, right now, they're making, you know, second and third stage engines. So, I think... Um, I think he said it was a 50,000-pound 50 pound, 50, thrust motor, and they have a 5,000-pound thrust motor, and these are already operational, uh, but they haven't flown flown to space yet. They're the first one is supposed to go to space this year. Uh, they've they're test firing them every day, which was so cool. Um, you know, two or three test firings a day. So you go up to their facility, and, and they're like almost right next to the interstate. 
I thought I was close to the interstate. You're right behind my wall right here, you know, 20 feet away is Interstate 25. You take that north, which is that way, another 80, 90 miles north, and uh, they're, they're a little bit further away, but they're, they're really close, you know, especially if you're firing off 50,000 pound rocket motor. <laughs> That's a lot of noise, really close to the interstate. And in the wintertime, uh, it melts a lot of snow. <laughs> uh, yeah, I had a great time there. Uh, let me click on this, see what that link goes to. Open link in a new tab. I wonder if this is, yeah, this is their, uh, this is their website. This is where I was. Yeah, and I saw this building and that's, you know, they just fire it out the back door and uh, <laughs> they've been eroding away the dirt on the on their hill. Very cool, you know, and that's what their their motors look like. And they they're 3D printed, so it's it's so cool. Um yeah, she also talked about the Draco boost glider. Um we are still on track to release that in a couple of weeks. Um we're working on the instructions right now, and that's the last thing to do is get the instructions done. I'm going to make a video series on those, and uh, but I haven't started that yet. That's a skill level five, but it's it's a, such a cool kit. Um, she also talked about how to angle your launch rod in a compass direction, how to mass, how to add mass objects to your database. Why does Roxim cost money? Um, because it's <laughs> because it costs me a lot of money. Um, there's a lot of cool features in Roxin that you can't get anywhere else. That's why it costs money. Um, what's the difference between Roxim and the Barrowman equations? Uh, it's cool. And if you want to find out, you know, what the answers to these questions are, um, if you go here to the YouTube video link and you click on the timestamp, it will take you right into the video where that is talked about. Okay. <sighs> I'm looking at the chat here. Uh, Johan de Sloper's here. He's from the Netherlands. So it's, uh, it's very late at night in there. I think it's somewhere around 10 o'clock at night. Um, Paris, uh, 10, 10, 10.07 in, uh, in the Netherlands. Getting up is one thing. I found it pretty difficult. A bit of luck also a thing. Okay. All right, no questions yet other than to design a low-wing low wing glider. Um, if you have other questions, I'll take those as well. Uh, let's see, so that's uh, what we talked about last week. And, and this week's uh, Roxim Live will be archived here next week. You know, it takes, it takes a couple of days for us to uh, create these timestamps so that uh, you can click on them. But uh, it will be here next week as well. Um, what else do I want to show you here on our website? So if you go to How To and Guides and come down here on the left side to Software, this is our kind of our landing zone. You know, we have video tutorials, more official than what I'm doing now, um, less mistakes in them. <laughs> um, you know, we talk about loading missing motors back into Roxim, the Roxim Live Training, which we're doing right now. There's videos for Roxim Pro. Uh, there's the free trial, frequently asked questions, system requirements, and version history are all talked about there. That's cool stuff. All right. Okay, so let's, I, I did have one question that I think I'll talk about real quick because it's a short question. Someone asked, that they emailed in and they said that uh, they, they had a rocket and they, my computer is acting really slow because I got so many things going on at once. Um, so that's just because I'm doing streaming and running Roxim and doing the chat and a lot of programs are open right now. So I'm going to close some, see if I can speed things up. Um, Okay, I'm looking for the blue streak. I'm looking for a rocket that has a streamer in it. So I know the blue streak does. 
Okay, so we open up the Blue Streak rocket right here, and his question was about streamers. And so if you go to the 2D view, you see this S right here. That's our streamer, and that's its location inside of this rocket. And if you um, highlight it, and you go to the Rocket Design Components tab, come over here, it will highlight the streamer where it is inside the parts tree. And then if you open that up, um, it will, what it tries to do is to predict a descent rate. Right now I have it in mock, but if you it changes to feet per second. So this rocket, um, and it doesn't have a motor in it, so if I put a motor in it, it will be a lot heavier. And if, when it's heavier, it's going to fall faster, so this descent rate will be a higher number. But that's besides the point. What his question was, was um, folding the streamer, do you, you know, what, you know, when you check this box, what happens? So if I click on it, you'll notice um, the only thing that changed was the, was the descent rate. It went from 22 down to just about 13 feet per second. And this, the question was, why does this happen? Um, and the answer is, um, he, th he thought that folding the streamer was just about saving space within the rocket. And that's really not what this feature is about. I got something below my feet that's in my way. Um, what it's about is the drag. You know, why does folding a streamer make the descent rate fall slower? And the reason has to do with frontal surface area. I don't have a streamer with me, but imagine a piece of cloth, you know, just a long ribbon of cloth. When, when it's falling down, um, what the, the airflow is flowing up along the, the length of the streamer. And the streamer is very thin. And so you don't have a lot of frontal area there trying to slow it down except that the, the streamer is whipping around as it's coming down. And as it whips around, you know, if, if the top curls over, now all of a sudden you've got a lot more frontal area. And that will, so you, what you really want is for your streamer to whip around like this. And that will make it fall slower. And what competitors have noticed is if you fold your streamer like an accordion, so you're just taking your strip of streamer and then you just zigzag fold it. And if you can keep those folds nice and sharp or, or very rigid, now all of a sudden your, your streamer width, instead of being just you know the width of the material, is now the width of a fold. And so you get an effect that slows the streamer down. And, and so what we do is here is when you fold the streamer, um, the drag coefficient of the streamer goes up. Now this only works if you can hold the folds in the streamer. So if you have like a cloth, like a shirt cloth, and you fold it and you try to crease it, it's not going to hold the creases. It's because that, that material doesn't hold the fold. Um, but some materials will hold folds, uh, particularly like a mylar. You know, you've seen like space blankets are made out of mylar. And um, they're thin, but they'll hold a fold okay. Space blankets, the material itself is a one half mil, so that's 0 0.0005 inches. Because it's so thin, it doesn't hold folds well. It will hold it kind of, sort of. Um, what holds folds better is material that's thicker, like one mil thick, which is 0 0.001 inches. So it's one thousandth of an inch. Or half a mil is five ten thousandths of an inch. Um, so for competition rocketry um, and when we flew FAI competition in early July um, down in Texas where it was like 100 degrees, 
um, we use one mil mylar. And then they were folded in an accordion well, way so that the surface area was wider. And then they would also whip around at the same time. And that would help increase the drag further because the object of that is to stay in the air as long as possible. And um, the person that stays in the air the longest wins. Um, and so that's what this is about. It's, um, it's about changing the, the drag coefficient by folding the streamer. It doesn't have to do with the space in the rocket um, because the volume of the streamer hasn't really changed. It's just allocating it different. If you want it to be the smallest inside the rocket, rolling it up is the best thing to do. Folding it, uh, theoretically, it has the same volume, but because the folds are wide, um, they catch on the, the side of the tube, and it just causes a little bit of drag as the, the, the streamer is sliding out of the rocket. Typically, it doesn't affect much, but I've had cases where I've tried to stick a really big streamer in a really small tube, and it's kind of like sometimes they can get wedged in there. <laughs> and then, you know, when the ejection charge hits that mylar, and mylar is a plastic, when heat plus plastic equals melt. And uh, at that point, then the streamer, it comes out, but it's all melted, and then it just doesn't unfurl. And that's bad. Ah. Johan says, we have an insane idea, or maybe I. Build a rocket from A0 paper skin on the body, low power. It will be 20 centimeters in diameter. I think it will be a good laugh. I'm not sure what that means. Um, A0 paper skin on the body. So kind of fill me in up. Kind of a Zeppelin construction body tube to save weight. Okay, I think I, I understand it now. Um, he's getting microwave interference again. Chinese hackers or Russians? Uh-oh. Maybe my uh, microphone needs a new battery. It could be too. My Bluetooth components are significantly heavier than the calculated mass in Roxim. For example, a payload tube calculated mass is 113 grams versus actual weight is 156 grams. Okay, I see. Mark says, okay. Can I change the database to get better calculations? Okay, I see what he's saying. Okay, well, uh, Mark, what was the diameter of your tube, of your blue tube? While you're doing that, I'm just going to grab a new battery and change out my battery in my... Uh, see if we can get some of these uh, microwave interference issues. better less static <laughs> okay all right so um, <laughs> Johan says the Duracell batteries are the best these aren't Duracell they're uh, the cheapest ones I could find on Amazon I don't know what size they are. They're, they're the little button cell ones. He says three inches diameter, 15 inches long, if I remember correctly. Okay, so let's start a new design. Uh, I didn't mean to save that. Um, to start a new design in Roxim, come up here to the new button. And we're going to start the design with a body tube because that's all we're interested in right now. And so what it's looking for is um, a tube. And he said a three inch diameter blue tube. So blue tube is made by a manufacturer called Always Ready Rocketry. 
So we're looking for the three inch. So here's three inch diameter right there. Open that up. And it says that the mass is 361 grams. So that's right there. Let me make this screen just a little bit smaller. Okay. Um, and he says it was 15 inches long. So we're changing the length to 15. And the mass is 112.9, which is really close to 113. And so in real life, he says that um, the tube actually weighs 156 grams. So is there a way in Roxim to um, change this so when he's designing, it's, it's a little bit more accurate? Um, and the answer is yes, um, but you got to do a little bit of math. So let me get out a calculator here. Here's my calculator, there's my calculator. We need to find the volume of the tube. And then we also need, um, we're gonna, because we're gonna change the material of blue tube. What's, what's happening is the density in the database isn't matching real world life. So if I go into the database, so you go down to the rocket menu, come down to edit database to materials and now we're looking for in the database blue tube uh, I'm scrolling through hopefully quantum tubing vulcanized blue tube is actually vulcanized fiber uh, let me click cancel here. I want to see what this mat material is made out of. So I'm going to open up the body tube and I want to look at it. So it's looking for blue tube. So that's what I was looking for just to make sure we're, we're looking for the right material. So back in the parts uh, materials database, edit database materials, I got to find blue tube. It's got to be in here because it's it's seeing, there it is right there. So right now it says um, 59.85 pounds per cubic foot. Um, so this number is probably a little bit low. So it's going to be a higher number than 59.85 pounds per cubic foot. So we need to calculate this new um, value for the density. And once we calculate it correctly, then we can um, put that number in. And then when we create a new rocket with blue tube, it should calculate it better. So here's how I had to do it. So cancel out of that. So this tube right here. Let me open it up. So we need to find the volume. So it has an outside diameter of 3.1 inches. So that's going to be my calculator. So the volume of a tube is the area of the tube times the length. So you've got the area of, the, of a disc times the length is going to be the volume. And we're working in inches here. So if I change this to feet, and that to feet. So now we're in feet here. So copy that number 25.25833 is the diameter. So we need to calculate an area. So um, to calculate the area of a circle, it's pi f divided by 4 times the diameter squared. So that's the diameter. So I'm going to paste in the diameter. And we need to square that and then multiply it times pi. Where's pi? Here's pi. And then divide by 4. So this is, if we had a tube, 3 inches in diameter, and oh, that's, that's the surface area of the, the disk. And then we need to multiply it by the length, and we have 15, so it's going to be multiplied by 15, 
and that gives us a volume of 0.786 cubic feet. Now this is a solid tube, but now we have a tube on the inside that we have to subtract out. So I'm going to store this in the memory, 0.786. So now that's stored in the memory. So now I'm going to do the same thing for the inside diameter. So 0.25 um, squared times pi divided by 4 and then multiplied by 15 is that. So point 0.736 and I need to, uh, so now I'm going to take the outside diameter, subtract the inside tube, so I'm going to make this a negative and then I'm going to add to the, uh, what the original number, I think it was 0.768, memory recall, 786. So now I'm subtracting that out, and so now the volume of the cylinder, so we subtracted out the inside, is 0 0.04988 cubic feet. Um, so now this is our new number, and I'm going to copy that number, clear my memory, I'm going to paste that into the new memory. Okay, so now I have the volume and I need to divide it or I need to take the mass divided by the volume and that's going to give us the density. So if you actually weigh it and it weighs, would you say 156 grams? Yes, 156 grams. So 156 divided by, recall of the memory, equals... Why does that says radians there? <laughs> Clear. That looks like the number there, right? So that can't be right. Something's not right because that was such a huge number. Oh, this is grams. This is grams, not pounds. <laughs> Okay, so we had 156 grams, so now I need to go to the internet and do a conversion from pounds to grams. So let me open up a new window and we'll do convertunits.com and we want to go from, where's my units? And we want to go wait. <sighs> All these ads convert to we don't convert. I hate this website. I'm going to do something different. This website sucks. Come on, learn to spell convert. Convert 156 grams to pounds. Gotta show me an ad. Okay, so this is our pounds right here. So we want to take that number, copy that, go back to the calculator, go back to the calculator, clear that, clear, clear, clear. Where's the clear? All clear. Paste in our, our new pounds divided by the memory recall equals 6.89 pounds per cubic foot. Now that seems low. I'm going to copy that number. Cancel out of here. Save my changes. No. Let's see what happens when I put that number in here. So I'm going back to the um, edit database, go to materials, find the blue tube, scrolling down through it. I missed it, I missed it. 
Welcome to where are you? Sort it. There it is. So this says 59.85. We calculated. Fifty-six grams. What's that? The number is wrong. From grams to pounds. All right. So, anybody see uh, where I made my mistake? I need to calculate the volume of the material in the tube, and then divided by the weight. Six point three four pounds divided by memory call equals yeah my my volume has to be um, like too high or something because it's giving me a really low density. Uh, this density here of 6.89, that's kind of where balsa wood is at 6 pounds per cubic foot. So this is way low. So, so my math is wrong, but my process is right. <laughs> and I stick by that. <laughs> ah. Okay, I'm looking for other questions. What do we got here? Uh, I'm going to go back up. Alfred Indy says, I purchased from Apogee the Estes so long and it is built. I built, your, built it to your suggestion of placing the launch lugs on the main body tube so that I can launch composites. Good. I had to create a so long single stage Roxen file and I kept the original for the two stage simulation. Did I do something wrong by creating a single stage ROXIM file? Not necessarily. Um, you don't necessarily need to have a separate file. Um, so if I go into ROXIM and I open up the um, so long. Type in down here, where's the so long? I'm looking in my database here. It might be under the Estes ones. Yeah, let's look in the Estes folder. Estes designs, so long. Save my changes, no. Okay, so here's the Estes design. And so, so what we were saying is the, um, take both of the launch lugs and put them on the, up the sustainer stage because when you launch this, if, the, if you only have one launch lug here and you only display the top stage, um, that launch lug is not really long enough to stabilize the rocket while it's on the pad. It will probably want to fall over and it'll probably snap that launch lug right off. So putting the other launch lug, you know, put one here and then one somewhere kind of like in the middle of the rocket so that it supports the rocket better while it's sitting on the launch pad. That's our suggestion. Uh, I have a two-stage rocket here in my hands. Uh, I just pulled the nose off. I was going to pull the stages apart. So this is two stage. And I don't know if you can see this, but I got one launch lug up here at the front. And then one.
As long as you got a good tight fit between these and these aren't wobbling around. Um, yeah. Uh, Your mic went out. Again? I didn't do nothing. <laughs> I didn't. Testing one, two, testing. Okay, so Allie just came in and said that my microphone went out. But uh, I'm seeing it working, so hopefully, yeah. Fabrice, he says that he lost audio too. I didn't do anything. <laughs> uh, Alfred Indy says it's always hard to find the so long in the design database, yeah. Terry Wheelock says, fix my split tail problem in Roxem. Um, I'm not sure what the sp split tail problem is. Uh, uh, Fabrice says ballpark figure for the um, blue tube is around 70 pounds per cubic foot. That, like I said, it's, it's higher than 59. Um, so 70 sounds in that ballpark. So that's probably right. Uh, Okay, so what was I going to do? Uh, oh, um, so you don't necessarily need to have a separate design file for just the sustainer. Um, it is possible to launch the rocket in Roxim with just a motor in the upper stage. So let me show this. This is a two-stage rocket, so there's the bottom stage, there's the top stage. and. I can load a motor just in the top stage. So we're looking at when we go to load motors, and that was this button right up here at the top. Um, this is our top stage. This is the bottom stage. And you can kind of tell because this has the bigger fins. Um, they're both 29 millimeter motors. Um, I can choose an engine. Um, you know, most people would probably choose an Estes motor since this is an Estes kit, an F15-8. Um, and click OK and see it loaded it there but there's no motor loaded in the bottom stage and I'll click OK and I'll just show you here um, if I turn off the bottom stage you can see the motor hanging out the front but there is no motor in the bottom stage come on where's my second stage there it is if I look in the back, you can see I'm looking right through the rocket and I'm not seeing a motor until I see the motor down here for the upper stage. And it is possible to launch this rocket without a motor in the bottom. So if I go here back to load engine, so we loaded that one before, go to flight events. Um, we're going to deploy the streamer at maximum ejection delay. Um, the starting state is 8-inch launch rod, which is probably too long for this. We'll go with a 60-inch, which is 5 feet. Launch straight up. So our launch angle, that's measured from vertical. Launch conditions, we're at an altitude of 700 feet above sea level with a wind of 6 miles an hour. And we hit flight profile. And it will launch the rocket and then bring up the flight profile. While it's doing that, let me take a sip of water. Okay, so here's the rocket sitting on the pad. And I push the launch button right over here. You can see the rocket's taking off. And we're only showing just one stage. And so I'm just speeding up the process by grabbing the slider along the bottom. And you can see it went up and it came back down. When I click cancel, um, you can see it's just um, showing a single motor in the rocket and it went 2197 feet um, and if I take that same simulation and put an F15 in the bottom stage and you can do that really easy by just you know clicking on that motor and then just click load all and it loads that motor in the bottom stage as well the only thing that I would change though is instead of using an 8 second delay 
use a zero second delay. Come on. So it's an F15-0 in the bottom stage, F15-8 in the top stage. Then we click Flight Profile, and it's going to launch. So the first one went 2197 feet. This one goes 3594. Um, it's really hard to see, but if you look closely, I wonder if I can do this. No, I can't. I can't enlarge that. But if we launch it, the rocket's taking off, and it looks somewhat similar to the other one. You see the smoke trail, but if uh, when the smoke kind of dissipates, we see this piece falling right here, and that's our booster stage, and it's falling down to the ground. And then our rocket went way up there, and it's falling down now. Here's its trajectory, and it's going to land somewhere down over here, it looks like. I can speed it up by just grabbing the slider bar and moving it along. You can see it landed down there. Yeah, so you don't have to have a separate file for just the sustainer. It doesn't hurt. It's just an extra item that's stored on your computer, but you know, computer storage is cheap and it doesn't really matter. Um, so if you, you know, want to compare a single stage versus a two stage, that's the way you do it. And it would be the same thing in the launch visualizer. Um, I don't think I have one open. The launch visualizer on rocksim.com. So if you open it up here, I'm just going to make my window bigger while it's loading. Um, let's see if I log in. This one will be, instead of 2D, it will be 3D. So I can select a new rocket design. So I'm lo logged in now um, and go choose design. Um, and I've already uploaded the so long. And I just have to find it. Here it is, Estes so long. Select it. Now your if you never used the launch visualizer before, it, it won't be in the database because each database is unique to every user. Um, so that's why you have to have an account so that we can store your rockets in there. Uh, but there's the rocket sitting on the pad, and you can see this is in 3D. You can see the wind direction is coming out of the west, blowing towards the east. And we need to pick a launch site. So choose a launch site. And it's looking for the database. Um, here's a launch site called Cloudbusters. Click OK. You can scroll through the list and pick one. Uh, what it's doing now is it's loading the launch site, a map of the launch site. Um, I already know the latitude and the longitude and coordinates of it. And this is like Google Earth, where you can, um, it is a 3D view. So I'm looking down on the launch site right now. The black arrow down there in the bottom left points to the north. So I'm just swinging the north around, you know, just by grabbing this and swinging it around to the north right there. So north is now straight up. And I zoom out, I can kind of see I got some barns over here, some parked cars. Um, what else is I can see in this view? Oh, here's a nice, that's where I should be launching over there. <laughs> uh, and if you want to launch over there, you just double click where you want to launch. And it puts the red dot, which is the launch pad, where you want. And then you have to click down here where it says confirm launch site so that it loads the new latitude and longitude coordinates. And it also loaded the altitude above sea level. This is here in Colorado, so we have mountains. And if I look at it a little bit further out, you can see there's mountains in the distance. You can see the mountains down there. There's some low hills over here, some bigger ones in the distance. Uh, so that's our new launch site, and remember we have a wind coming out of the west, so I'm going to probably um, angle it, I want to make this a little smaller here, so I can see my controls, and this is my launch angle, so I'm going to angle it 
into the wind, and I'm going into the wind by 11 degrees. And I'm going to swing it around so it goes to the west. And I'm just grabbing the little little compass wheel right here and swinging around. You can see that the rocket reoriented itself. Um, you can change these other things if you want. Um, since this is a symmetrical rocket, changing the roll angle, it just spins the rocket around the pad. Um, so here's our launch conditions. Uh, we have wind, and I'll check the wind. We have, let's make it a seven mile an hour wind so that we can compare it to what the previous one was. And it's coming out of the west. You can see the arrows coming from the west towards the east. And if you wanted to change it, you could. So we need to load rocket motors. So we had Estes E-15s. I'm just scrolling down through the list to find the Estes. There it is, F-15. Um, this is the upper stage, and so that's eight seconds. Click OK. This is just like Roxim. So we've loaded the F-15-8 in the upper stage, and you can see, you know, that's stage one. When it's in the bottom stage, it's right here. So. I'm going to do a load all like we did before and then change the delay to a zero. Okay, so now our engines are loaded and we can run the simulation. And the, the launch button is under here under my face. Right down here. So when you click that, it'll ask you to simulate. And we'll go ahead and do that. And so it's running the simulation in the cloud right now. And it's redrawn the rocket on the pad at our launch location. And it's kind of half hidden in the ground because our altitude was just a little bit off. That happens, but it, you can see we're in our our nice uh, field right here. It's got a uh, irrigation system in it. So our rocket's right there in the middle. Let me change this to a trajectory view and it's going to reorient into everything like it didn't want. I want north up so kind of so we can kind of get a frame of reference here. So north is off, off in the distance, west is right here. And remember, we got a wind coming from the west blowing across our field. So where will our rocket land? So it's launched somewhere down there. And, it's, and this right here is a mini view of, the, of this, but it shows the rocket better, although our rocket is half underground. Uh, when we launch it, the rocket takes off. It came up out of the ground right there. You can see the smoke. And now it's coasting. Oh, there's the second stage igniting. Oh, it's going really high. But because we angled it and it's going into the wind, it's not going to go quite as high as the uh, the one bef that we ran in Roxim. So right now it's still going way out here. It's the parachute hasn't there. Okay, at this point the parachute has come out. I can see it down here in this smaller view. Um, the parachute is up there. Let me just pause it right there. Um, I don't know where the rocket is, um, but I can click this button and it will find it in the sky. Okay, so it's dead center in the middle of the screen, so it's somewhere right in here. I just need to zoom in to find it. There it is. Okay, so there's a streamer on this rocket. That's that streamer. So there's the rocket. It's, you can barely see the fins because they're black against a black background. There's the streamer. Let's get a trajectory here. I want to see the trajectory path and the extruded ground path. And I click OK. And find the rocket again because I lost it. There it is. This green line is the trajectory, so it's, it's descending along that, lo that line. Let me zoom out. I'm zooming out, kind of getting the lay of the land here. Oh man, this rocket went really far. Because you can see this red line here is its ground path. 
So there's the original launch path. It took off, it went towards the west, it arced really far into the wind. At this point it reached apogee, um, and at this point the, pair, uh, the streamer popped out and now it's coming down and it's probably going to land somewhere in this area if you follow this green line, draw an imaginary line down. And if you really want to see it, just grab this slider here and slide it all the way to the back. Yeah, so it, it landed right there. And if I wanted to see the rocket right there, click find the rocket and then start zooming in. So it didn't quite land in a tree or a bush, but there's one that's really close. <laughs> this, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have considered this one a good launch um, because of how far it weathercocked into the wind. I don't like to see him go that far away. I want to get my rockets back. But if you um, only launch this as a single stage rocket, so if I go to select rocket motor, and take out the motor in the booster stage. So you select the, the booster stage and then uh, clear. And it cleared out the motor in the booster stage. And then if I rerun the simulation, I click the launch button, which was under my face, and then simulate. So we'll see the same simulation again, except for this time, it shouldn't have a booster stage. Again, we're under the ground. So let me. Uh, get out of the ground. Yeah, it's in the smoke now. Okay, so the rocket, you don't see any booster stage on it and we're like two seconds into the flight. It's going to go for 41 seconds so I'll pause it right here. I'll just slide it a little bit further over. And let's see a trajectory view. Yeah, you can see before the rocket, I think it landed right here. And at this point, the rocket is still over the grassy area, the nice grass. So this is a much better launch, but this was just launched single stage. It's a little bit, a little bit too much weathercocking for me, but I think we'll get this one back a lot easier. Don't have to walk nearly as far. It says that we're going to have to still walk 822 feet, so quite a ways away. Okay, so uh, that, so that answers the question. You don't need to make um, two separate files for t for a rocket with a two-stage rocket. Uh, uh, Fat Bank says, "Looks like crop circles." <laughs> It looks like crop circles, but that's an irrigation uh, system. Um, you know, the, the middle is right here. It's got this long arm, and it just goes around in circles all day long, watering whatever it's watering. If you look at a lot of places that are uh, farmland, you see a lot of irrigation like that. Terry says, when I design a low-wing glider in rocks and the wing splits, at the rear and doesn't display properly. It splits to the size of the engine tube. Hmm, I am not sure. I'd have to see a picture of what you're talking about, Terry. Um, you can, you can uh, email us and we'll respond back and then you can attach a of your design and look at it because I am not sure. I'm sure we can figure out something because it's just a matter of orienting the parts right. Um, yeah. Okay, was there any other questions that I missed? Lots of good questions again today. Terry Wheelock says, ooh, can you design a streamer that acts as a single helicopter blade when deployed? 
Um, Roxim doesn't do helicopters um, because the math to figure out the descent of a spinning object is just beyond our capability. Um, but what you're talking about is called a monocopter. And I've seen monocopters in real life. They usually spin going up as well as spin coming down. I've never seen a single monocopter that's just deployed out of the rocket like a helicopter. It should be possible. It, it should, in real life, not in Roxim. Roxim can't do it because of the spinning part. Um, in theory, a single blade is the most efficient, um, but you're going to have a problem with wobble because you have this mass spinning around, so it's going to it's going to cone on you. Um, that that's typically why helicopters have multiple blades, um, so you don't have this mass on one side and nothing on the other, and then it does weird things as it's spinning. Um, but a single vane on a like a windmill are like the are should be the most efficient. They have less drag. Um, so theoretically, you could design one like that. That would be pretty cool. And to make it flexible, hmm, that's interesting. That's how do you design a flexible helicopter blade? Typically, this <laughs> this goes into. Um, satellite design um, because satellites you know some of the early satellites they have to deploy the solar panels and the solar panels have to fold up or roll up and so they have to be flexible and it's it would be kind of like you know like a tape measure you know, a metal tape measure. Um, when you unroll it, it's stiff, but it can still be rolled up. So you could, that could be one way to design a flexible helicopter with a single blade. Um, that'd be interesting. So, Terry. Go at it. Tell, tell me how it works out. I don't have time to do it, but you can do it. Uh, cool. Um, Alfred Indy says he did the single stage design because I did a CG and weight override on it without the booster included. Yeah, that. I can see that. That makes sense. Because you probably wouldn't want to do that if it's a two-stage design because then you'd have to pull the, the mass object out. Fat Bank S is a 48-inch airframe naturally divisible into a 12-foot, 12 12-inch 12 payload section and a 36-inch fin can. Um, sure, why not? It's just, you know, you're taking a 48 inch long tube, splitting it in half, or splitting it at 12 inches. Yeah, that should work. Um, we don't, at Apogee, we don't ship 48, well, we do, we, we ship blue tube, which is 48. We don't like to, and the reason is that the shipping expense on a long tube is ginormous. Um, all the Apogee tubes are 18 inches. And the reason is um, you can make a long tube by putting a coupler in it. And by being 18 inches, they can, they can ship for a lot less cost. So it saves customers money by doing it that way. 
but some manufacturers like Blue Tube, or you know, Always Ready Rocketry, that makes Blue Tube, they make theirs inch, 48 inches long. And there's really not a reason why it has to be, because you could, like I said, you could put a tube coupler in there and take shorter ones and splice them together and make a long one. And if you're using blue tube, you're really not worried about weight because <laughs> blue tube is heavy. <laughs> but yeah, you could do that. Ah, okay, so it's three o'clock. So I guess we're done for the day. Uh, we will be back next Friday, I hope. Um, as far as I can tell, I'm not, I should be in town. Um, so we'll see you then. So I'm going to give a countdown and then we'll end this. So in five, four, three, two, one, go out and launch something. <laughs>